Well, it's my great pleasure to introduce Marco Pedersoli. Marco is assistant professor at ETS Montreal in Canada. He obtained his PhD in computer science in 2012 at the Autonomous University of Barcelona and the Computer Vision Center of Barcelona. Then he was postdoctoral fellow in computer vision and machine learning at KU Leuven with Professor Pitelars and later at INRIA Grenoble with Drs. Verdi and Smith. His research is mostly applied on visual recognition, focusing on reducing the complexity and the amount of annotation required for deep learning algorithms. He has authored many publications in top tier international conferences and journals in computer vision and machine learning, such as ECCB, CBPR, ICCB, PAMI, or International Journal of Computer Vision. So, well, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. And whenever you are ready, please go ahead. Okay. Thank you very much for the invitation. <clears throat> I'm really happy to be here today and uh, at the Andalusian Research Institute on Data Science and Computer Computational Intelligence to talk about efficient deep learning. Um, I will start with, oops, with a very quick background about uh, myself. So, um, as you can see on the map, I've been uh, jumping around a bit around Europe. So I'm originally from Brescia, a small city in the north of Italy, and I did there my undergrad. Then I, um, during my undergrad, I, uh, I was in Madrid for Erasmus Mundus, and it was a lot of fun and very nice. I discovered Spain, and then I liked so much Spain that uh, after an internship, <coughs> in the north in the Netherlands in Eindhoven, I came back to Spain for a, a doctoral, a PhD in Barcelona. And there I discovered computer vision. <clears throat> I worked uh, for almost five years between uh, master and uh, PhD. Uh, and the topic was mostly object detection with deformable models. Uh, then after that, I jumped to the north again to KU Leuven in, uh, uh, in Belgium uh, for a postdoc with Tina Tartar Lab and Luc Van Gogh. And there I, I started to work in deep learning because during my PhD, this deep learning wasn't there yet, or at least wasn't very, very known. And uh, there I worked again uh, with deep learning, but also the formation detection. So again, a topic related to machine learning and computer vision. Finally, I jumped again down and I, go, I went to Grenoble at the INRIA Institute. And it's where I met also uh, Pablo. And I worked with Con uh, Cordelia Smith and Jack Berbick uh, in, uh, again, computer vision related talks with special attention to attention models and to recurrent maps. Uh, and there I was uh, mostly working on a project about. Uh, uh, describing images with the uh, caption. So as you see, uh, I've been uh, jumping up and down in Europe. So the, the thing is you would expect at a certain point to converge and uh, seeing this map, you will see that I would have to converge around here, around either, I don't know, Germany or Switzerland nearby my own place, but things went a bit differently. And so I ended up in Montreal, so a bit farther. And uh, there is where I am now. I, I arrived in Montreal in 2017. And I'm uh, at uh, a new university that is uh, Ecole Technologie Supérieure uh, in Montreal, ETS Montreal for short. And this university was uh, born 44 years ago. It's an engineering school with 25% of the engineers of Quebec. It's uh, close to industry because uh, we want our students to, to be able to, to work with industry and to be already able to perform. Hello? It, is it the audio okay? Yes, yes, no problem. Okay, okay. Yeah, I heard fine. something in the background, sorry. And so, as I said, it's close to industry. We have uh, internships 
and uh, we are really trying to, to improve also the part of research. We were hiring uh, new entelected professors and uh, we, our level of publications has been increasing a lot since 2010. Uh, within ETS, I'm at Lydia, Laboratoire d'Imagerie, de Vision et d'Intelligence Artificielle. Uh, by the way, uh, ETS is a, a French-speaking uh, university, but still uh, uh, the part of research is done in English. Uh, so in, in Livia, this uh, uh, group, we are around 10 professors working on different fields of computer vision. Uh, we have around 50 graduate students. We work on uh, images, video, sound, text, everything where we can extract information. And the applications can be smart buildings, autonomous driving, medical imaging, document analysis, and topics are uh, also broad and can be deep learning, optimization, uh, probabilistic models, fusion, reinforcement learning, so a kind of broad spectrum. Now going a bit uh, more to my research uh, at ETS, I have uh, a few PhD students and master students that are working with me and also with some colleagues here and in other universities. Uh, and uh, as I put at the bottom, I'm always looking for excellent students. So if uh, any student is interested in exper experimenting uh, Montreal weather, so Can Canadian weather, uh, minus 20 in the, in the winter. But uh, apart from that, it's a very nice environment, nice city, um, everything. It's, I was very, very happy here. So anyway, uh, if you if you are interested, let me know, and uh, we can talk about the possible collaborations or uh, possible uh, master or PhD with me. About my research, um, the, I have I put this eye just to show that uh, um, what I do is computer vision. It looks a bit like Big Brother, but. Uh, uh, I always try to, to keep the positive part of this uh, machine learning and computer vision. So trying to, to work for well. Um, so my topics can be divided in three groups, efficient learning. So how to make machine learning efficient. Uh, I will talk more about this during this topic. So I won't go into detail. Efficient data, how to, uh, use the data in a more efficient way. So how to reduce the amount of data for training uh, or how to use uh, weak supervision, for instance. And the third topic, which is I, maybe the, the newest one for me and uh, quite interesting is data exploration. I call it data exploration. And it's about finding ways to uh, explore data because often, the data that we deal with is so large. Think about, for instance, a long video of a person performing an action. An action. In this case, we don't really need to uh, analyze the entire video for knowing which action the person is performing, for instance. So if we have a way to explore this data and know which part of the data it's useful and which part we should analyze it in more detail, we can save a lot of computation and maybe even improve performance. Um, now I will go to, to the topic of this, this presentation. So uh, the outline is divided in four parts. Uh, first, I will start with some motivation about what, uh, what I want to do and how. Uh, then I will talk about uh, different families of methods for efficient deep learning. I will give you a bit, uh, I will talk also a bit more about my research in this uh, efficient deep learning. And finally, some latest and interesting results about um, this uh, efficient deep learning. <clears throat> motivation. Um, I think it's quite clear the motivation of why trying to, to make deep learning efficient, because 
for performing deep learning, we really need a lot of computation, a lot of memory. Here on the right, I put a table where we show uh, the top accuracy uh, versus uh, amount of computation in terms of uh, gigaflops of uh, the most used networks, neural networks, convolutional neural networks. So classic uh, BGG, AlexNet, and uh, ResNet, and so on. And what we can see from this graph is that if we want to improve performance, we need to increase the computational cost for sure. As you see, the top performing methods uh, reach almost 25 uh, gigaflops of computation, which is really a lot. So the idea is to find ways to uh, push all these this, uh, models towards the left so that we reduce the computation while keeping the same amount of performance. And the size of the circles, each circle, of course, it's a model, the size represents the amount of parameters. That's also something that we are interested in because amount of parameters normally means amount of memory needed to keep these parameters in the GPU. And so if we can reduce that, it's also an advantage. Uh, so we can talk a bit more in detail about computational power needed for these models. For instance, here uh, I took this graph where uh, uh, we see for uh, image recognition that uh, the winner of uh, ImageNet challenge, the most important challenge for image recognition in 2012 was AlexNet and was the first time a convolutional neural network performed so well on attack and was performing much better than uh, all the uh, handcrafted features methods that were used before. But uh, if we go ahead of three years, we get a method that was able to reduce a lot the error on ImageNet from 16% to 3.5%. So again, a quite impressive uh, improve of performance. But this improvement doesn't come from free because uh, at the same time, the amount of gigaflops from 1.4, the amount of computation went from 1.4 gigaflops to 22 gigaflops. So an increase of 16 times. Uh, same things happen also for speech recognition, where uh, in 2014, the best uh, model was having an error of 8% with 80 gigaflops. And in the year after, uh, the best model uh, increased the computational cost by around 10 times, and uh, just to reduce the error from 8% to 5%. So the message here is that, yes, uh, with deep learning, we are constantly improving the results, but this doesn't come for free because we need more and more computation. <clears throat> and this uh, translates also in terms of speed. Here I have another graph where we see for uh, uh, object detection, a very important task where we try to detect objects in images. Um, where we see the overall mean, mean average precision. So we want our detector to have the highest mean average precision and versus GPU time in milliseconds. So this, if we are here in the graph, it means that uh, the detector takes one second to analyze an image, which is normally too much because we would like these detectors to be real time. But we can see again the same thread. If we want to push up performance, we need to increase using the, the same GPU, we need to increase the computational uh, time needed to analyze these images. And the same way, if we want to reduce the, uh, the increase the speed of the GPU, we need to, uh, at a certain point, we reach a kind of barrier where we are not able to reduce further the computational cost unless we reduce also the performance. So the aim of 
efficient deep learning is to to again try to beat this barrier to find methods that are performing well while at the same time uh, keeping uh, uh, very low computational cost and finally what is also interesting it's uh, what we should consider it's energy consumption because uh, although if we think about a single gpu on our computer uh, doesn't do much in the sense yeah it will heat a bit the room but it's still feasible when we go to data centers it's it's really a lot of computation as and as the, the worst is as you can see is that the most performing uh, gpus are also uh, consuming a lot of energy here in this graph you can see the red are the the gpus that are uh, consuming the most in terms of uh, watts in terms of energy and as you see if you really want to push gpus to perform the, the best we need to consume also a lot of energy so are there uh, efficient deep learning can also help to to reduce the energy consumption we'll see in some cases we can do things also on that okay first uh, before really starting uh, analyzing the, the, the methods that we will be considering, uh, I wanted to clarify something. Um, when we talk about efficient deep learning, uh, we consider mostly four different concepts. One is the parameters of the model. We consider that we are using mostly uh, neural networks, for instance, convolutional neural networks. So we have uh, parameters are all the connections between neurons or between filters in convolutional neural networks. So when we want to be efficient, what we want to try to do is to reduce these uh, connections. We talk also about memory because we are interested in uh, reducing the amount of memory used uh, for the GPUs because uh, uh, normally in gpus we we have a limited amount of memory and so uh, we would like to be able to run bigger models in smaller gpus third one is computation so how to reduce the amount of computation so we we talk normally about uh, gigaflops or flops so the number of operations that uh, uh, processor gpus is, uh, is performing and finally energy because this computation translates into energy so how to make those approaches more efficient and consuming less energy normally uh, what we consider what is the standard thinking is that um, we can reduce the amount of parameters and if we have uh, fewer parameters we will reduce also the amount of memory if we reduce the amount of memory, uh, we will also have less computation because computation is performed on the uh, memory uh, used. And if we reduce computation, we will uh, reduce also energy. This is very ideal because in practice, we can see that uh, the relationship between parameters, memory, computation, and energy is not clear. It depends on a lot of uh, situations for instance parameters translating into uh, memory it's not always the case for instance in convolutional neural networks uh, we have four uh, few uh, parameters compared to fully connected uh, networks but the amount of memory of CN used in cnn is much more because we have to store big feature maps of uh, image representation uh, memory and computation, of course, there is a connection, but uh, when we have, uh, for instance, uh, a representation that is based on sparse vectors, uh, this is not efficient uh, for uh, GPUs to compute. So in, in this sense, we can have uh, reduce the memory, but this wouldn't translate automatically in a reduction of the computational cost. <clears throat> and finally, computation and energy. 
yes, there can be a direct connection between computation and energy, but it's uh, very hardware dependent. So we can see uh, the, the, how the computation translates in energy. It depends a lot on the hardware that we are using. So last, very last uh, slides before really checking methods. Uh, it's about uh, when we talk about efficiency, when, during training, during evaluation, and uh, I will say, at least in my interest, it's in both because evaluation is very important because we it's when we deploy our method and we want this to be efficient. For instance, if we use a camera to detect people, we want it to run real time. So we need our detector to be very efficient. But at the same time, we want to be efficient also during training because uh, especially with modern methods, they require a lot of data and uh, very expen expensive methods. So it's, uh, it's important to be able to reduce the training time because otherwise we either, we are Google or Facebook where we have uh, tons of GPUs, uh, but even in their case, when they train very large models, training can take ages. So we would, li we would like to have uh, reduce time for training. And I will talk about many different methods, but just to give you an idea, when we talk about reducing evaluation, we can think about uh, weight pruning, because if we prune weights in a smart way, we will reduce the computational cost of the method. When we talk about reducing training, we can think about methods that accelerate the gradient, so methods that uh, are able to use the cost of computing gradients because most of the training of uh, neural networks are based on gradient descent. So if we, are, uh, if we have methods uh, to reduce this cost, um, it will reduce the training time. And then we have also uh, what I call inference acceleration. So if we have methods that are able to reduce the cost of inference of a deep learning model, this will automatically translate in reducing the evaluation and reducing the training. Because if we reduce inference, inference, so it's uh, going from uh, an input data to the output. And this is used both during evaluation, but also during training. Um, OK, I will, after this brief uh, clarification of certain topics, I will go to more in detail about uh, some of the families of efficient deep learning approaches. Just to clarify, um, so there are so many different approaches and methods for efficient deep learning. Here I will try to give you an overview, but of course it's limited. And uh, I sampled a few interesting methods here and there, but uh, it's not uh, exhaustive of all what is there. Okay, so I will, I've divided uh, approaches for efficient deep learning in six families. I will start from uh, weight pruning. So what is weight pruning? It's uh, a method, as I said before, to go from uh, a network where all the connections are active because normally it's what we do. So when we have a neuron, this neuron is connected to all the, the neurons of the previous layer. In the standard case, we have also kind of different models like convolutional neural networks. We have uh, uh, a receptive feed. So it's not uh, uh, a neuron is not looking at everywhere in the image, but just uh, a local region. But uh, in any case, what we try to do with weight pruning, it's uh, taking a trained neural network and uh, checking uh, this network and finding ways to uh, remove some connections that are not important for the final result. And uh, normally the simplest way to, to perform prune, pruning is to check the magnitude of this connection. If the magnitude is low, so it's close to zero, it means that the weight is not very important for the network because if the weight is zero, it means that uh, 
there won't be any signal propagating from one layer to the other. So we remove those neurons that are close to zero. We will see later that this is not optimal, but it works pretty well. So let's uh, have let's see more in detail an example of what what we can do with weight pruning. Uh, here in this graph, I show the percentage of pruning uh, in a, in the x axis and the loss in accuracy in the y axis. So this line in zero means that uh, we don't lose any accuracy. And um, if this is the original model, and and we use it as a reference, when we do pruning, we can prune. Uh, 50% of the weights, for instance, at this point, and we see that we have a very little uh, re reduction of performance. So this is the amazing point of pruning is that with neural networks, normally <clears throat> we don't really know why, but we can prune a lot while uh, obtaining uh, very good performance, losing just a little bit of performance. Of course, if we increase the amount of pruning, uh, performance will start to drop and we reach 80% of pruning where performance are dropping already 4%. But we can improve even further because if after pruning, we retrain the neural network with only the prune weights, we can see that the performance are actually much better. And it happens something also very interesting is that uh, if you prune and retrain, you, you can reach certain points where the performance is actually slightly better than the original model. <clears throat> and this is probably because these big neural networks with uh, many weights are normally overfitting and uh, are oversized. So if we reduce some useless weights that are just producing noise, we can have even slightly better performance than the original model. And so in this case, we can see that we can reproduce the original performance cutting 80% uh, of the weights. This doesn't mean that the model will be uh, much faster than before, but at least we will see later about that. But at least uh, we, we reduce by 80% the, the, the number of parameters that we have to store. And then we can see that if we increase further, then the performance will, will drop quite quickly. But we can add another additional step that can further improve this performance. And it's repeating this uh, pruning and training multiple times. So we have an iterative approach where we prune, we train, and then we prune again, and we train again. And with this iterative approach, we can reach up to 90% uh, pruning while keeping the same performance of the original model. And when I saw this kind of results the first time, I was amazed that uh, so many parameters are actually useless in a neural network. And this is still unclear or not fully clear why uh, this is happening. But uh, in the end of the talk, uh, I will uh, give you some hypothesis about this problem. Um, an interesting paper that used this uh, kind of pruning approach is called dense sparse dense uh, uh, method, where uh, uh, what they did is uh, an improvement compared to the standard pruning, where again they start from a dense model, they prune and they obtain a sparse model, but then and uh, so again, depending on how much you prune, you can reduce a little bit the performance or not. But then the interesting part is what they did is uh, with the sparse model, they reconnect everything. Uh, so every neuron with the other. So they reconnect everything. They add again the weights that were removed, but they initialize those weights to zero and they let the model train again. And this approach, it's, it's interesting because, of course, you end up with a final model that is the same size as the original model. So you don't improve in terms of uh, memory and number of parameters. But 
this model performs better than the original model and uh, quite a bit. So uh, here in this table, you can see that for most, most of the uh, computer vision models, computer vision uh, convolutional neural networks that are used, uh, what, when you use the dense sparse dense approach, performance is improved and top error is reduced for most of the models. So that's uh, an interesting approach. If you want to improve the performance of our model, of your model, you can just do this and you get better performance. <clears throat> I uh, something that it's very interesting that uh, it's a bit old, but I think it's still very relevant. It's another way to prune. We said that uh, uh, the, the, a way to prune is using this, uh, um, this pruning based on, uh, on the magnitude of the weights. But you can see that this is not optimal because um, when you prune based on the weights, uh, you don't know what you are really doing on your uh, loss function. So a way to improve this is to really check the variation of your loss function, so delta E, uh, with respect to your parameters. And here we can see that what is, what is shown is a Taylor approximation of the loss function where we have the first order term where it's the gradient of uh, our function with respect to the parameters second order term with the Asian and the Asian is uh, div divided in two parts. The, so the Asian is this uh, uh, matrix where we, we have the second partial derivative of the uh, loss with respect to um, pairs of uh, parameters. And uh, what, what it, this is divided in two parts, one that is uh, applying the partial derivative on the same uh, the same weight, and the other one is applying on different weights. And uh, so this here we have this optimal brain damage. That what it says is that we want to find uh, a way to be sure that we remove those parameters that do not affect our loss. So uh, it's more principal. It's a more principal approach. And, but this can be applied only at the end of the training because we have some uh, assumption that are valid only at the end of uh, network training. So we train the network and then we can use this approach. And uh, the first assumption is that uh, the uh, model converge. So if the model converge means that it reached uh, a local minima, so the gradient there will be around zero. Uh, with very deep learning models, it's known that it's not always the case, but this is the assumption. So this part, we, we want to look at this part because the gradient will be zero. Then we don't look to this part because we approximate the shunt only with the diagonal. And so what we say is that, uh, we will look at this uh, terms of the Asian and uh, we want these terms to be uh, as small as possible when we, we, um, we select our, the parameters that we want to uh, remove. And, and this uh, has been shown that it's uh, actually Sorry, I, okay. Has been shown in this old paper from Lecan that uh, using the optimal brain damage compared to the magnitude pruning uh, gives better results. So the, in this case, the mean square error of their model was reduced when uh, using this approach. Um, Jumping to a more recent approach, here I, I present uh, a method that was in ICCD 2017. It's called the Slimming Network. And this one 
it's uh, it's very simple and uh, i really like the idea because the idea is that um we don't modify the the structure of our network to be able to remove uh parameters to remove layers we just check the we have batch normalization on layers and if we check the scaling factor associated to batch norm we have a good way to know which weights are important and which no because where the scaling factor is close to zero again it means that uh, the importance of the corresponding channel on the next convolutional layer will be almost nothing so we can remove that an important thing that i should mention here is that uh, in the previous uh, approaches i was talking about removing weights so it was kind of what we call unstructured uh, pruning because we remove any weights without any structure here what we are talking about it's removing filters or channels in a convolutional layer so to remove a channel means that you need to remove the entire filter used in a cnn so it means that uh, it's a structure pruning because we don't remove a single weight but we remove the entire filter of a cnn of course when we do that the amount of um, weights that uh, that the amount of filters that we can prune it's lower comparing to removing all the weights because it's uh, in a coarser scale either you remove an entire filter or not you can you cannot remove a single weight but the, the advantage is that you can really translate this into a speed up because if you remove weights uh, in a unstructured manner you end up with a sparse representation. And as I said before, sparse representations are not good for GPUs, for, uh, uh, for computing. And so the, the reduction in uh, parameters won't translate in a reduction of computational cost. But if you use a structure method like this, where you reduce, you remove filters, this can, uh, uh, can be seen again as, uh, a structure approach and there the reduction in uh, number of filters can translate directly into a reduction of computational cost okay to conclude this part about weight pruning and i see already that i'm uh, quite late so i have to speed up for the next um, i just wanted to compare the weight pruning a bit with the what happened in uh, our brain and it's something that I discovered uh, recently, is that uh, when uh, a new uh, baby is born, he has around 50 million trillions of synapses in his brain, in, in the neurons of his brain. But then if you check the number of synapses when uh, the baby is one year old, it's uh, 1,000 trillions. So it has a crazy increase of number of synapses. But then if you check again when it's teenager, the number goes back to the original, so to around 50 trillions. So in this sense, here we have a kind of pruning. Uh, we don't know exactly why and how it's happening, but it's, uh, it's interesting that there is uh, an interesting connection between what we do with the uh, uh, artificial neural networks and what happens in our brain um second family of approaches for reducing the computational cost is rank approximation i will try to be very quick and then uh, if you have questions we can i can talk more in detail about the different methods so low rank approximation is a very well known technique i wouldn't go into detail the idea is that we have a matrix and we can instead of uh, parameterizing directly this matrix we can uh, uh, build this matrix uh, matrix as a, um, a dot product of two uh, matrices with uh, uh, a fewer number of vectors. And so what will happen is that the, the, the corresponding matrix uh, <clears throat> has a low rank. So it, it means that we, we can use a fewer parameters to approximate this matrix. 
And this is good because uh, we can use this approach for uh, convolution because uh, convolution is a 4D tensor. And so we can try to reduce the number of parameters used to represent this tensor, approximating it with the low rank approximation. There have been quite some papers that uh, use different uh, models, different approaches of with low rank. Uh, for instance, this uh, efficient and accurate approximation of nonlinear convolutional neural network was presented in CVPR 15. The idea is quite simple. Again, we have a feature map. We have W that are uh, convolutional filters that are applied to the feature map to uh, compute the next feature map. So instead of using directly these filters, what they do is they reduce um, the size of these filters. So they, they, the output will have uh, the first number of channels where the first is lower than D. And so this means that uh, there is a saving of computation because the, the expensive filters of a convolutional neural network, you think, can think about filters of three by three size or five by five size, they, they are applied with the fewer channels. So the computational cost is reduced. And then there is a second step where this a feature map is transformed back to the original size with one by one convolutions that are more cheap, that are cheaper to compute. So com uh, altogether, the combination of these two gives the same, uh, gives a good approximation of this model while reducing computation. Uh, there are also other techniques that uh, go farther in this direction, how to, to approximate, uh, again, these filters with the low rank approximation. For instance, uh, in this paper that was published in the MVC 14, uh, what they do is to decompose this square filter of D by D into a, a row filter and column filter. So again, this way uh, we reduce the computation. And this can be done uh, in uh, one step approach where we apply uh, horizontal and vertical filters, and then we restore the original uh, feature map size with one by one convolution, or it can be done in two steps. And uh, actually in the paper, they show that the two steps approach. So the C it's uh, better than the B approach. And something interesting, it's also, what we really do to approximate these filters. We can uh, approximate these filters in, uh, in a way that we try to reconstruct the filters. The advantage is that we don't need to uh, check the data. We just need to uh, approximate these filters. Or we can also approximate these filters in a way that uh, the output is similar of what we would get with the original filter. And uh, as we can see in the graph, when we use what they call data reconstruction, so try to approximate the reconstructed data, performs better than using filter reconstruction, because in this graph, we present the uh, loss in accuracy versus speed up factor. And you can see that when we try to approximate the data, it's uh, better. It's uh, the, the error grows slowly. And the best, of course, is to combine the two. You can see the green line. It's giving the best performance because we can have a speed up factor of five, for instance, and the, co the corresponding loss, it's uh, very low. Uh, but of course, if we want to optimize the output reconstruction, we need to, to have not only the model, but also data. So it's a trade-off. Finally, um, we can generalize this approach. And this was done in uh, iClear 2015, where again, we have our filter, our tensor, and we can decompose this tensor as a product uh, of several uh, vectors. So we can see here that we have convolution. It's about applying a filter on a feature map. 
and for each location we obtain an answer. What can we do is to decompose this filter into uh, columns and rows and perform the same, so two-step approach, and this is what I presented before, but a more general approach is to, as we have a 3D filter, we can decompose it into three vectors. And so we go first one where we pass, uh, we, the vector is computing only, um, it's one by one size and it's uh, evaluating only the channels. Then a second vector that is evaluating only the rows of this feature map and the other only the columns. So with this three-step approach, we can perform the best uh, decompression compared to the other methods. Okay, finished also uh, this approach. We go to quantization and I see again, I, I'm really running out of time. So I think I will try to um, maybe be very quick for the rest so that I can talk also about the, the most interesting and new stuff. But quantization, the, the concept, it, it's quite simple. We have a, a, a representation. Again, our weights are normally represented as float uh, 64 or float 32. And with this, we normally don't have problems, but it takes a lot of memory and a lot of computation. So a simple way to reduce this computation is quantize these weights. Instead of having a continuous value, we can uh, approximate all the weights to uh, a single value, um, a quantized representation. And this can be done uh, with uh, uh, integers and we can go down up to a binary representation where a filter can have only two values, either minus one and one. And uh, what was really surprising for me is that even with this very uh, coarse representation, the models still perform reasonably well. So it's, uh, it's quite amazing. And again, uh, when we talk about quantization, we have to be careful uh, what we are talking about. It's, is it quantization about uh, only on inference? So we have a chain model and we can reduce the computational cost by just quantizing the weights. This is normally straightforward because we don't have to deal with backpropagation. But uh, it can be nice also to have a model that it's quantized and can be also trained. But in this case, we have to be a, a little bit more careful because training a model uh, with quantized weights uh, may have some problems because we are dealing with uh, discrete values. So um, we cannot use directly back propagation on discrete values. So we need something differentiable. Um, so I, I give here a quick example of what is a very uh, a, the, the most quantized approach that uh, that we can use. So we go from a real value uh, neural network to a binary network. Again, as I said, uh, we use bits, so we can have only two values. In this case, it's uh, either zero or one. And what is interesting is that uh, what is normally a, a matrix product. Uh, used to compute the output of a network. Uh, so we have a matrix product plus a nonlinearity applied to the output and we get the final output of the neural network. We can do something similar with binary weights. So we have binary weights, we have, uh, sorry, binary representation of, the, of our model. Uh, we have binary weights and what we do instead of uh, just the, the scalar product of the two, we perform an XNOR uh, with bit count product. And this will produce um, an output that has, uh, uh, represents how many times the, the input uh, was similar to, to our model. And once we use sign, we apply sign on this uh, representation. So we have a thresholding, we end uh, with again a binary representation. So we can use this 
uh, as a substitute of the original neural network approach. Uh, I will skip a few slides. Maybe I will uh, show here something interesting that is uh, the different ways we can uh, quantize a neural network. So we can quantize either only the weights, but the gain in computational cost is reduced because we still have to compute a floating point operation on the input, or we can quantize both as I uh, showed you before, and we get uh, a huge speed up in performance because instead of performing the standard floating point products, we perform just bitwise operations, but we have also a drop in performance. So while these models achieve a, a, a accuracy of 56 per, percent on image net this model is low to 44. Uh, so one, uh, what we can also do is to uh, in this case we were talking about just using a model uh, transforming a pre-trained model on a binary model here we can see that there are also approaches that try to train a model with uh, um, with binary weights and uh, for doing this we have to use some uh, uh, we have to apply some changes compared to the binary approach and uh, so first change is to reduce the learning rate because we are dealing with this uh, hard quantization so some way it's better to have a reduced learning rate also using a different uh, regularization that forces weights to get close to the binary values. Uh, if you're interested, I can talk a bit more in this afterwards. And then finally adding a scale coefficient in the softmax uh, last layer to improve. And if we do all of this, we can see that the performance on ImageNet, it's much better and it gets closer to the performance of the uh, normal model. So it's between five and 10 points below the performance of the normal model, but we have a, a huge compression and a large reduction in comp computational cost. Uh, to finish with this quantization approach, uh, I wanted to mention that there is also a different way of quantize based on clustering. So you can think about your weights are uh, 1D representation. And this 1D representation can be clustered to uh, some values. So for instance, here we have the float values and here we have the discrete representation and for each position, we select the closest uh, cluster that can uh, represent these values. And um, I wouldn't go here in the details, but again, uh, feel free to ask more details later. But um, this approach can be trained. So we train to find the center of the clusters that best represent our weights. So if we check it in terms of representation, here we have the number of parameters and uh, the corresponding values of parameters. Here we have uh, a distribution and we can see when we apply this quantization instead of having a continuous distribution of values we keep only some centers of values and but you can see that these centers are kind of approximating the original distribution while reducing the amount of parameters that we have to store so that's a, a kind of uh, learn quantization because we don't quantize with a fixed uh, a grid of values, but we quantize based on the data that we are dealing with. And here we can see that uh, quantization is a kind of uh, complementary to pruning because uh, here we can see, for instance, the performance of a model. Uh, again, here we, we check the accuracy versus compression rate. And we can see that the model that uh, uses both pruning of the weights and quantization performs much better than uh, using only pruning or only quantization. So it's uh, interesting to combine the two. Good, I am quite late. I'm thinking uh, maybe for the next 
three approaches, I will give a very, uh, very fast overview, and then I will go to something uh, more interesting, the last part. So computational, uh, conditional computation, the, the idea is simple. It's uh, reducing the computation, computational cost of uh, deep learning approaches based on the data. So if we have a simple image, we will use a simple model. If we have a complicated image, we will use a, a more complicated and expensive model. Of course, we need something that will tell us if an image is simple or not. So we will we'll have an overhead for uh, selecting which kind of model we want to use for each approach. But if we do it in a smart way, we can gain, uh, uh, we can reduce the computational cost of the approach. A uh, simple approach is based on cascade. So in this case, we want, they want to perform face detection and they start with a very uh, coarse resolution representation and a very small model. And then if the output is not sure about uh, what is in the scene, it will give the output, the, the model, the, the input with the higher resolution to a second network and so on uh, until the end. So in this way, for those parts of the image where it's clear that there is no face, we will compute only this model, which is quick. For those parts of the image where uh, we think there is a face, we will compute a more complex model, but it will give better performance. Other approaches are uh, with the ResNet, where we can have we can learn either to really uh, use the computation of a convolutional layer or just to skip it uh, based on on the training. So and depending on the image. So for some image, we will uh, compute this F1 and F2. For other images, maybe we'll compute only one or the other. So again, it's a way to save computation. And finally, uh, there were methods where uh, they kind of uh, select how much computation to perform on each pixel of the image or on each subregion of the image. This looks very interesting and promising in theory. But if the aim is to save computational costs, it's not very appealing, again, because the convolutional neural networks are run on GPUs and GPUs they need dense data. So if we have an approach that selects some pixels but not others for the GPUs, the, the gain in computational cost is not much. And we have also methods that are again based on this kind of concept of cascade. So instead of just having a final decision in the end, in the network, uh, after a few layers, we have already a classifier that decides whether uh, a model is what uh, an image is an object or not, an object of interest. And we have this over different layers. And each time we decide if the classifier is sure about the decision, we stop and we save computation or we go further. But the interesting part of this other work is that uh, this approach is done uh, on multi-scale, and this helps to take decisions in a smart way, especially in the beginning of the network. <clears throat> I will go quick to distillation. Distillation is uh, another approach to reduce computation. The idea is that instead of training our model directly on the uh, one hot labels, so on labels that are telling here there is a dog and there is no cat, no other animal. We have a teacher. What is a teacher is another neural network that has been trained. And normally it has, uh, it's a large model, can be an ensemble of model, and it performs, uh, it's computationally more expensive than the student. And what we do is instead of giving the student, passing directly the student these labels, we pass the student the output of the teacher. So it's a kind of uh, smooth version of this. And uh, the idea is that this, uh, the output, of course, will, uh, it's a set of probabilities that says uh, uh, where the object of interest is, if the output is correct. And uh, what is interesting, we see that if we train in this way, using the output of a teacher, 
uh, we can get better performance than training in the standard way. And this is the concept of distillation. So we can see instead of using directly the original target as a ground truth, we use the output of the teacher uh, with some additional smoothing that is given by this temperature uh, value that we scale here. And if we use the right scaling, we can again obtain better performance. Here, a very uh, a simple example of the performance. We can see that uh, uh, we use we have a certain baseline with a certain uh, error rate, and uh, if we use uh, a perform uh, if you use a model with an ensemble of ten neural networks. Uh, as expected, it will perform better. But then what we can do is using this ensemble as a teacher in uh, distillation and uh, using a single model, so much less computation, we, we increase its performance by more than one point. So to get closer to this model that is 10 times more expensive. So that's the nice concept. And to finish with this, a set of families of approaches. We go to architectures. So instead of trying to uh, change the some pre-existing architecture with most of the methods that we mentioned before, what we can do is to find uh, new architectures that can be thinner, thinner, uh, lower resolution using lower resolution images, fewer layers, fewer parameters or different uh, operations to reduce the computation. And uh, there have been quite some approaches on this. The first one or more interesting one in the beginning was QuizNet, where instead of using directly uh, a convolution, they were first reducing the number of channels uh, for the convolution with one by one convolution and then applying a three by three convolution on a reduced set of channels. So again, saving computation. And then playing a bit also with the max pooling so that uh, the teacher map is smaller. Uh, but this approach was saving a uh, number of parameters, but uh, computationally wasn't changing much. Uh, then we have mobile net where uh, it reduces the amount of parameters, but also it's more efficient. And the core idea of ImageNet, uh, MobileNet, is to use depth-wise convolutions, where instead of applying uh, multiple convolutional filters on all the channels, here we apply uh, for each channel a different uh, convolution. So we save a lot of computation. Of course, it's not the same thing as using different uh, uh, filters on all channels, but combine with then a one by one convolution that can uh, uh, mix up the different channels. Uh, performance is comparable to the, the normal convolution, but with a much reduced computational cost. And finally, there is this shuffle net that was presented, I think, in uh, 2017. And here, uh, the idea is to use group convolution. So instead of uh, uh, using all channels for computing convolution, which is very expensive, because uh, if you think about uh, convolution with all channels, the computational cost is square to the number of channels, because we we have the input channels and the output channels. So we, for each input, we have to evaluate all the outputs or the other way around. So with group convolution, we analyze only a, a subset of the channels. And this re uh, reduce a lot the computational cost. But at the same time, as you can see in this figure, um, if here we have uh, this group of channels that are considered, when we apply multiple convolutions, uh, the it's like we are considering only a subset of the entire data. So its performance will be reduced because we are not considering all the channels, all the features to, to compute the next feature map. But what they propose in ShuffleNet is that we can still use this group convolutions, which are computationally very, very efficient, but then we shuffle the channels. So we mix up the channels 
we've sent some channels to the other group convolution. In this way, we have the same performance of, or similar performance to a normal convolution, but we reduce computational cost. With this, I finish the part about uh, um, the different family of methods. Um, now I have a question for you because I see that time-wise uh, we are quite late. I, I have some slides about my research in this, uh, this field of efficient deep learning and also some latest results or that I found interesting in the same domain. I think presenting both of them uh, may be too much. Uh, maybe uh, you could tell me which one uh, you would prefer to see and then uh, so that we can save a bit of time and then maybe in the questions I can talk also about the other. Um, so thank you very much, Marco. Thank you. What, uh, what do you think or what people are interested in more? I think it's time okay. Um, uh, we usually give time to the people okay to think their questions. So it's time now for questions. So, um, uh, so, so if anybody... Sorry, sorry, uh, Fabio. I was just thinking because I had this uh, still these two topics. I was thinking maybe to present one quickly okay. and then uh, leave the other for the questions. But uh, it's up to you. If you prefer, we can go directly to the question. Maybe I will just wrap up very quickly. And I think that you go on with uh, these two topics. Uh, uh, during this time, people can think. Uh, um, uh what question they want to make okay i'm writing the top in the chat okay um so i will go quickly uh with my research and then uh, and then we can see from that okay um so what i presented are as many different approaches for uh making uh, computation more efficient but there is a kind of niche of approaches that i didn't present and uh, i've been doing some research in this one and i think it's uh, quite interesting of course i'm biased because it's uh, my research so it's what i'm doing but i will try to summarize it to you so as i said before it's important to reduce the computational cost of these approaches not only during training, but also during, um, if, uh, not only during evaluation, but also during training, especially if we have large models, like for instance, uh, if you heard about like this uh, BERT and GPT models, they have uh, a huge amount of parameters and they are computationally very expensive. Uh, so for instance, to train one of these models, they estimated a cost of 4.5 millions for just running the, the all the GPUs on a cluster. So it's it's crazy. So it's just this just to say that uh, reducing the training uh, cost it's also very important. And the idea that I'm presenting is that during training, what we if you think about uh, what we are doing is to analyze or to iteratively uh, apply some, uh, some procedures on the same samples multiple times. On each epoch, we re-see the same samples. <clears throat> so this uh, gave us the idea of uh, maybe we can approximate some part of this computation in, with sampling. For instance, if we have a sum of terms, instead of really summing all the terms, what we can do is sampling a few of these terms. And this sampling will give uh, an approximation of the sum. But a good point is that uh, this approximation is uh, in expe expectation will give the same results as uh, uh, the, the original sum. So this is the kind of Monte Carlo approximation. And uh, I haven't seen too many works on this, but I think it's very interesting. And uh, to give you a better idea of what is 
this kind of approach if you think about stochastic gradient descent when we have uh, when we use stochastic gradient descent instead of computing the gradient on all samples we compute the gradient on a subset of samples so this is exactly the idea uh, and we see that with stochastic gradient we save computation and we obtain similar performance but this kind of approach can be applied not only to samples but to many other things inside our model um, i did this for emotion recognition uh, in videos and uh, the first part was uh, to to apply a softmax pooling instead of using either average or uh, um, max pooling using a softmax pooling is a weighted sum of the features or the output and the advantage is that depending on the weights we can reproduce both average or uh, max pooling if the weights are all uniform we have average if the weights are one for one feature and zero for all the others we get max pooling so in i have the first paper where we showed that uh, this kind of pooling works well when we want to recognize emotions in a video like in this case you can see that uh, uh, only one part of the video is really responsible for the emotion and here i see the probabilities of a certain emotion so using this kind of pooling it uh, gives better results and makes sense but then uh, what uh, what i did in a second paper was to uh, instead of using directly this pooling because if we use directly this pooling we have to, to evaluate the entire video and when we use instead of using 2d cnn we use 3d cnn the amount of memory that we require is very high and so what uh, we need to do is to sample and uh, i will say i will i won't go in details because we don't have time but we propose a method to sampling uh, these videos so that we reduce the computational cost and the memory while performing uh, the same weighted sum, the same uh, uh, softmax pooling. And we call this stochastic softmax pooling because instead of analyzing everything, we sample. But as we do this in an iterative way during training, we end up with uh, uh, similar performance as, as uh, we will evaluate everything at every iteration. Here are some examples of uh, what we do. So you can see that uh, uh, this curve represents the, the, the most important part of the video to recognize the action, like in this case, a cartwheel. And here we you can see our sampling that focuses on the interesting part of the approach okay so this i think uh maybe i can skip this part and leave it for question if uh, anyone is interested just i wanted to say i wanted to thank pao because uh, uh, this presentation uh, is a kind of collaborative work with him because uh, uh, pao is uh, by the way he was he did his phd in barcelona as me but later and then uh, lately joined uh, Element AI, where it's um, right now. And so these slides were actually initially uh, some course that I was giving in French in, uh, at my university. Then he, he selected uh, some and uh, made a presentation uh, for, for a course, a uh, master course, and then uh, I took this presentation and I improved it for, for this one. So that's it for the moment. Thank you. And uh, I hope uh, uh, you like the presentation and I'm here for your question, comments or ideas. Thank you very much, Marco, again, for your nice presentation. And okay, now is, it's time uh, for our audience, okay? Our audience, uh, is free to make any question. So the first one is uh, Angel. Do we... Hello, do you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay, uh, thank you, Marco, for your presentation. It's really interesting because um, I'm just starting the topic of 
the efficient deep learning and green artificial intelligence and all this kind of, of stuff of stuff and and I just recently see a, a kind of method uh, called spiking neural networks and I don't know if you if you know something about that kind of of uh, models and it's like um, they perform some kind of quantization on the activation function so basically they these models perform um, activations on it's 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 a, it's a binary activation so um i don't know if, if you know something about this kind of models or yeah no sorry really, no sorry as i said the the this efficient deep net uh, deep learning it's mm -hmm. uh, so large that it's difficult to keep track of everything mm -hmm. i i guess if you say that it's uh, like the output is binary it has some connection with these binary networks that i quickly introduced mm -hmm. but uh, i didn't see the paper so i don't know in detail but uh, okay I, I will be yeah if you can send me the paper i will be yes sure sure it's to... it's really they are really interesting i think because you know they, they can be implemented in hardware and they are very and, very and, efficient and the aim is to to be efficient right yeah yes because they 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 get rid of the metrics multiplication basically so they just integrate all the weights and do they it. compare with this uh, x net uh, x not network maybe uh i actually i don't know i don't know i don't know thank you thank you thank you so thanks angel so next it's time of um, a question by Alberto Castillo. Alberto doesn't have um, a microphone, so he wrote uh, his question. So he says that uh, Marco, when one training is in the training stage uh, or the training stage cost, um, there are large models and you want to optimize this process. Okay, isn't it? How, how could you proceed, okay, in the training state of a large model, okay? So maybe, okay, here, uh, Alberto writes the, the question is not, okay, very explained, but okay. So in the training phase of, uh, of a learning model, okay, so how can you optimize hmm. the process of the training, okay? Yeah, yeah. Um... So there are many different ways to, to do that. Uh, let me see if I can go to my slide. Um, yeah. Um, so going back. So I presented here uh, six families of methods. Some of them are uh, just for inference so we don't touch the training but there are others that uh, are also for training for instance when we talk about uh, architectures if we reduce the computational cost of an architecture using for instance uh, some of the approaches that i explained uh, this... okay marco marco yeah Ah, okay, vale. Uh, I, I have the microphone yet. Uh, the question uh, concretely is um, uh, the cost uh, of the training of a very large model like a GPT-3. Yeah. Uh, the cost is uh, is high, so uh, you cannot uh, try and test uh, your procedure. Uh, for example, uh, you think uh, I can optimize. Uh, with uh, one, two, and three methods, okay, but you cannot uh, try and test because uh, the, of the the high cost. Well, what could you do, or how do you proceed for in this question, in this type of large models? So, uh, for instance, one interesting way, if I fully understood your question, is using distillation because. With distillation, I'm not sure, but I think there are distillation methods for also these uh, um, large uh, MLP models. And the, the idea is that you don't use directly the, 
the large model, but you can train a much smaller model uh, with the help of the output of the big model. And this will boost the performance of the small model. So you, you finally, you use a smaller model, but it has been trained in a way that its performance is closer to the big model. That's a way, for instance. Okay, uh, to, uh, you try with a subset of the, the general data set, for example, or the model. Uh, okay. So you are saying, uh, because also the, the data is so large that you cannot uh, really use all this data, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, you can use maybe a subset. Yeah, or there are like uh, this, uh, low rank approximations that uh, they try to approximate filters uh, and they can be done uh, even without data. That's maybe a way. And of course, now here I was talking about convolutional nets, but also normal neural networks. If you think about weights, they, they, are, they are like matrices. So you can always try to reduce the rank of these matrices and uh, and for that, the, there are approaches that do not need um, training data. OK. Thank you for your talk. Uh, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Alberto. Um, Carlos? Carlos Núñez? Uh, yeah. Uh, so first of all, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, to be honest, it was really interesting. I didn't know there were so many different approaches for reducing complexity. So all of this is really new for me. So uh, my question is about the part of wave planning, because you yeah. mentioned that wave planning is sent only for uh, the um, for uh, increasing the I mean for reducing the complexity. You can also use it uh, regardless of complexity to increase the performance. So you mentioned that part. I think like uh, you prune the model, you add the weights, and you retrain it. But I didn't quite grasp the idea of I mean how you do it because if you add the new weights, uh, go, uh, what do you do with the old ones? You fix them, or you train the whole model again. You train the old model again. I can quickly go there. Yeah. So that's, uh, is this what you were talking about, right? This dense sparse uh, dense. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, the idea, at least in principle, is very simple. Then uh, not sure if there are some uh, details because many times in these deep learning models, ideas are simple, but then to get them working, you need a lot of small details to be right. But um, so the idea is, yes, first you prune, then for uh, uh, you have your sparse model, then you reconnect those weights that were pruned, you initialize those at weight at zero, and then you retrain this model. But like so, the whole model. Yeah, yeah. For some reason, this helps to improve performance because it's like you get rid of um, of the parts that weren't really doing much. And then you give a chance to the network to find new values for this that might be more helpful for the task. Yeah, so, I see. But yeah. the thing is that the weights that were good, that weren't close to zero, so you didn't prune them, you yeah. maintain them, but you also retrain them. Yeah, so yeah. You, that, you... I don't actually understand that because it's like uh, you're using that pre-trained value as an initialization for them instead of random initialization because that's I think that's the only difference from yeah, yeah, retraining yeah. the whole model from zero, let's say, from scratch. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And this is the the point. Uh, naturally, I I had a uh, few slides about this also later because yeah it's as you said it's just initial initialization but yeah that is what actually helps for for improving performance because okay. uh, yeah yeah and uh yeah i had if if i have a few minutes i can also uh talk a bit more about this because i have some latest results 
but uh, I will prefer first maybe to, to get a few more questions because I already talk a lot. And I think we are already late with the, with the schedule. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlos. So, uh, Danny, it's your turn. Yes. Yes, thank you. Marco, uh, it's a great talk. It's very interesting. Me and Javier are working, have been working in improving ways in neural networks. And um, we did the part of his PhD. And now we want to consider another option to improve better the network. What do you recommend us? To try to optimize the architecture or quantification? Sorry, quantification or? Or try to simplify the architecture. Uh because we were considering the architecture, but now that you have so us so many options, so I get double about that. <laughs> well, they are all interesting. Um, I think what is your main aim? To reduce computational costs at training time, at test time, or well, reducing the memory? In that case, uh, actually we are not, uh, or goal is not to reduce so much to reduce the the time but to uh, to add better the network to the problem using transfer learning i see so you are using pruning for for that you yeah. prune based on the new uh new data so that the network yeah. is adapted to the... uh, we, will, we, are, we consider if which technique of them could be worse with yeah. learning or could be more generalized? I saw uh, some papers that uh, they use distillation for, for that because with distillation, the good point is that you don't have to, you, you can deal with diff very different models, but you transfer yeah. the knowledge from one to the other. So you can do it also when you change domains. And uh, so you, you kind of distill the information of your teacher of a big model on your new domain uh, with your student. And that is something that seems to work quite well. Um, yeah, I think that's interesting. And then, uh, yeah, for sure, architectures, it's also a very good topic. And I have uh, a slide about this. Um, I don't know if you heard about this paper. It's uh, relatively new. It's RegNet. No. Um, it's about, uh, at least what they say, it's uh, to design uh, a space design. So what it means is that instead of trying to uh, learn a specific ar architecture, because now the, the it's quite trendy to try to um, to learn architectures instead of uh, designing them uh, manually. And here, what they, they want to try is not to design a single architecture, but a family of architecture that can scale depending on your need and your computation. And uh, I mean, what is interesting is that in the end, they came out with a set of rules that can be used for building good networks. And finally, they really look like what we do when you when we do it manually but there are also some interesting things like uh, they say that uh, the max depth it's reduced to maximum 20 layers or around 20 layers that in each layer the the width the number of channels should increase over uh, layers and with a slope of 2.5 so every time you increase the number of layers you increase it by a 2.5 factor and yeah, other things. But yeah, just to say that uh, um, you can gain a lot with uh, trying to find the right architecture. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Danny. So is there any, any more questions for, uh, for Marco?
Yes, Nacho. Go ahead. Yeah, hello, Marco. Can you hear me well? Uh, yeah. Yes. Hi. Okay, so first of all, thank you very much for your presentation. It was very nice. And I found it really interesting. Uh, but uh, two questions uh, arised me when uh, I was listening to you. First of all, um, you were talking uh, most of the talk, I think, about convolutional neural networks and uh, fully connected or dense neural networks as well. Yeah. Um, but uh, in my case, for example, I'm working in anomaly detection, which uh, in time series data, which yeah. involves uh, LSTM or long short term memory cells, yeah. which are really, really um, high cost in computation. Yeah. And uh, I found these uh, ideas really interesting, but I don't know how to apply them, for example, for a forecasting LSTM model or uh, autoencoder LSTM model, for example. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so for uh, recurrent neural networks, one problem is that they are sequential, right? So you cannot frame them uh, in a single shot because you have uh, the state of the network that should be propagated from one to the other. So that's the biggest problem because especially if you have very long sequences, you cannot analyze every time step of the sequence in a single shot. You have to really go through uh, the time. And that's a big problem when you want to train these models. How to solve that? I mean, there are, I, I saw, it depends a lot on the problem, of course. I saw, for instance, for uh, some problem, they, they could get, good results with convolutional neural networks instead of uh, uh, recurrent nets. So in that case, you don't have this, the problem of analyzing the sequence step by step. So you save, uh, you, you can do the training much faster. Uh, and then the, the other option, which it, uh, can, yeah, I think it can still reduce the computational cost, at least in some cases, it's to use uh, transformers where you can improve quite a bit depending on the task compared to recurrent neural networks. And, uh, and in that case, again, you can also save computation because I think you don't need to, to perform the training in a sequential way. Yeah, I think they can do it in with the whole sequence. And uh, yeah, so uh, for example, you find it suitable that I can use uh, some uh, of these efficient deep learning techniques. If I use a, for example, 1D convolutional neural network uh, followed by several LSTM uh, cells, I could use some of these techniques with uh, convolutional neural networks before applying the LSTM. I could, for example, separate it in uh, two different models or, or structures. So I can optimize one independently from all the other. Yeah, although if, if you have uh, LSTM, you'll always have the, this problem of uh, like yeah. analyzing your data sequentially during training, which makes it very slow. I don't know what's the length of your data, but uh, if it's more than uh, a few, like, maybe 10 or 20 time steps, it might get very slow. Yeah, it could be even 900. Yeah, so that's uh, really high. Then, yeah, yeah, and one question, which is, I think, a little bit more easy. <laughs> All these techniques are really interesting, but uh, have you found any framework better to work in an efficient way for deep learning than another? Uh, I think in in my case i like to work with pytorch but uh, i am not sure if uh, if any framework is really better for this specific kind of efficient deep learning um, i like pytorch because it's easy to to test things but of course if uh, performance is is your final aim then maybe for the final model uh, you might think to go to something else. Although now I saw that there is also a way to port PyTorch code into C++ code, but I never tested it. Okay, okay. I think that if you, you, if you use PyTorch, 
that is an answer. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nacho, for your question and for your participation. So, Marco, I think yeah. it's time to be uh, to finish. Okay, as you see, okay, the topic here in our research institute is now, I can say, trendy. So people are starting to, to work in how to make deep learning more efficient, efficient because we know that artificial intelligence in the near future, we need a, a more efficient artificial intelligence. So thanks for, for your talk. I, I have to say you thanks in the, you know, on behalf of Pablo. Pablo is now in, in one lecture, giving a lecture. So it's not possible to, to say to you goodbye. So I don't know, Paco, if you want to, to say something before uh, saying goodbye to our uh, presenter. Only a few words to thanks, Marco, by your very interesting talk. Uh, really, a lot of uh, members of the of the institute are, have an um, interesting question, and uh, it is a topic that we have interest. As uh, some of them, Daniel, explained to you that we are also working with with pruning using machine algorithms, and we, we have a lot of interest in the topic. And if possible, in the near future, it will be a pleasure to discuss with you any kind of collaboration. In parallel, as I told you, I would like to to discuss with you a possible. Uh, state of the art about the, the efficient deep learning for, for my journal and we can uh, start to discuss the potential content of the of, and position paper on overview via, via email uh, and we can also discuss in a talk about about that really it, it was a pleasure to to meet you and, and to attend to your very interesting talk thanks thank you very much it was a pleasure and uh... Of course, I am be very open to possible collaborations. Um, I don't know if, uh, how can I, maybe if I share the slides, uh, I will give also my email. So if any one of you wants also to contact me, uh, feel free to send me an email about, uh, I don't know, possible projects that uh, you'll be interested to collaborate. And, uh, and finally, I wanted to say, yeah, maybe, in a future where we will be allowed to, to travel, I will be very happy to visit you personally. And uh, yeah, thanks. I hope, I hope you, you can visit us next year, if possible. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so uh, uh, do you have the, the slide, the Marco slide? No, I don't have them. So I, I will Marco, send it to Please you. send us. Yeah. And I, I have your email. I also will great to know you. To, to start to, to discuss potential. The, the, yes, the, the, Marco, the... usually distribute the, the, the slides of the presentation to all the people of the Institute. Um, maybe I guess that uh, Pablo told you that we published the, the recording of the, of the seminar yeah, 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 on yeah, yeah. the internet. Yes. Okay. So uh, I guess that we are finishing this another edition of the seminar. So tomorrow I will send you the, uh, the update of the news of the new seminar for next Monday at half past four at the, at the habitual hour. So uh, it will be about fake new detection in the area of COVID-19. So I guess that uh, it, is a, it will be a very interesting talk. So goodbye to, every, uh, to everybody and see you next Monday. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.